Bé, molt bon dia. Anem a començar l'acte acadèmic d'inauguració del curs 2012-2013 a la Facultat de Ciències Econòmiques i Empresarials. En primer lloc, per presentar el nostre convidat d'avui, dono la paraula al degà de la facultat, el professor Vicente Ortudo. Good morning. Abans d'introduir el speaker, let me give the thanks to the two sponsors of this event. In times of budgetary blues, in times of budgetary crisis in public university, it will be completely impossible to have this type of the event without the sponsorship from Esteva, at my right, and from Garrigues, at my left, at your right. Well, David Kaller. David Kaller, MIT, PhD in 91, I think same year than some of the professors I have seen in the first row here. He is professor of applied economics at Harvard, with John appointments at the Economics Department at the Canadian School of Government and the School of Public Health. He has been advisor to President Clinton and is President Obama's senior health care advisor. His contributions are at the cutting edge of research on public health and health economics. He has worked on determinants on health, on lifetime costs and benefits of medical technology, explanation of health care systems differences in efficiency, obesity, etiology, many things. As you know, health economics has been very much inspired by Kenneth Arrow's work on health insurance and medical institutions. Arrow gave the first Yiso de Economia, the opening lecture, 20 years, 22 years ago, at the start of this faculty, at the start of this university. It's a privilege for us to have today, for these years, you saw the economia, the world's most cited economies, according to a reliable report of the World Bank, written by Tony Collier, Madame Wester, on 40 years of health economics through bibliometric lens. In that slide. Professor Keller, distinguished scholar, uh, involved citizen and long distance runner. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very, very kind introduction. It, it is a great pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, I, I saw the um, list of people who have given the opening uh, lecture in the past, and I thought, what am I doing on this list? <laughs> and then it, it, it struck me that, um, as, as you heard, I'm a little bit of a runner, so maybe what I should do is, if you don't like it, just run as fast as I can <laughs> and hope I reach either Madrid or Paris before you can catch up to me. Although I'm not sure, I'm not sure that would work. I, I, um, I am, I'm really delighted to be here now because while the world is preoccupied with an economic crisis and that justly gets a lot of attention, there are other issues that are just below the surface in countries and how they run their economies. And if we don't deal with those, we're going to have another crisis coming on shortly thereafter. And so the one that I want to deal with, the, the topic I want to deal with today is one that's extremely important, not because it's going to fall apart this minute, although healthcare systems always do uh, uh, often threaten to fall apart, but because if we don't deal with it as countries, as a set of global institutions, we will find ourselves in a slow motion crisis, kind of like the current um, crisis that's affecting Europe and the United States. So I, I want to uh, talk about what we can do. It, the sort of title is The Continuing Search for the Ideal Healthcare System, which is a little bit grandiose. Um, but I will tell you a bit about where I think health, what health, economists, uh, health economics has to say about this. And, um, 
uh, and where the United States is going and try and open that up and see whether that makes sense for, um, uh, for a, a setting like this. So <clears throat> let me start off. Um, most of you, my guess, are lost about healthcare, yes? Okay, so here's your American quiz question of the day, which is, who is this? Yes, so this is the doctor on the TV show House. That's usually who you call when you have a health care problem. Um, you actually called this fellow here. Uh, one of my uh, supposed friends wrote a blog post about me describing me as an accidental socialist. <clears throat> this made my colleagues very upset. One of them down the hall said, accidental? What's so accidental about it? Another colleague said, socialist, aren't we being nice this year? <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about uh, what an accidental socialist thinks. But let me first start off a little bit with um, an international comparison of health systems. And I want to focus on the US and what I will call Europe. And by Europe, I mean every country with a high income that's not the United States. So I've moved Japan into Europe, and I've moved Korea into Europe, and Canada, you never knew it, is actually a part of Europe. But, it's <coughs> we, it, you know, they say that Americans are bad at geography, but really, in fact, we're quite good at it. <coughs> um, so, and I want to sort of make the point that they're kind of facing the same sorts of issues, but d having done so in different ways. So the first obvious comparison across systems is they spend different amounts. This is a, a, a chart showing you medical spending in um, uh, the US, in Europe, now expanded to include the United States. And you can see there's sort of a mass of countries that spend about, you know, you know within a thousand or two thousand dollars per capita of each other. Um, and then there's the United States. Um, and the United States is uh, quite an outlier here. Um, so it looks like the United States is sort of fundamentally different. Um, and actually, the U.S. has gotten increasingly more isolated from Europe as time goes on. So in uh, 1960, the U.S. spent about 10% more than Europe did on health care. This is as a share of the economy. And today, the United States spends about 50% more than Europe does on health care. Now, let me give you, uh, there are going to be various quiz questions here. So you have to answer my quiz question. So here's one quiz question. Which of these uh, numbers is more, which of these lines is more appropriate to spend on healthcare, the US line or the Europe line? So, how many say the US line? Remember, you do have to vote for something, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is not a democracy. You have no choice. You do have to vote. How many say the Europe line? So the vote seems to be about 100 to nothing. <laughs> in this room, so we'll declare it for the Europe line. Okay, we'll come back to that. Um, one of the consequences for the United States is that we have enormous budget deficits as a result of that line. <clears throat> this chart, which I won't go into much detail on, basically shows you that the U.S. has a fiscal problem that is spending is increasing more rapidly than revenues to the government. The biggest part of that is not Social Security spending. We are having an aging population, but it's not that big a deal. The single biggest part is because medical spending is increasing. And the single most important component of that is that medical um, costs per person are going up. As a rough approximation in most uh, of US history, medical costs have increased about 1.5 to 2% above the growth of the economy. If revenues increase roughly with the economy, which with a stable proportional tax rate they would, then 1.5% above that is going to give a funding problem. And every country really has some version of that problem, although it's more severe in the U.S. than elsewhere. So let's see. Okay, so you're, you said you like the European model more than the American model, so I'm going to force you to take another quiz question. <coughs> Excuse me. Which of these do you agree with? On the whole, the healthcare system. Now I want you to answer about Spain here. On the whole, the healthcare system works pretty well, and only minor changes are necessary to make it work better. There are some good things in our healthcare system, but fundamental changes are needed to make it work better. Or the system has so much wrong with it that we need to completely rebuild it. Okay, minor changes, fundamental changes, or completely rebuild. Answer about Spain, if you would, please. How many say minor changes? Maybe about 10%. Uh, 
How many say fundamental changes? <laughs> Maybe about 90%. Uh, How many say completely rebuild? Hmm. Let me show you the answer when you ask that in different countries. These are the countries that have been surveyed the most. Notice they all speak some foreign language. Um, actually, people are not very happy with the medical care systems. In no country do you get, um, this is the share of people who believe only minor changes are needed. In no country do you get more than about a third of people who say that they're basically happy with their health care system. And actually, the rates have been falling over time. So in Canada, they took a big drop. Um, in Australia, they've gone down. The U.S. was horribly low. It's gone up a little bit. In most countries, people are less happy. They're not particularly happy, and they're increasingly unhappy over time. Um, if you ask people in the U.S. what they don't like about the healthcare system, you say to them, what are the top two things you don't like? They'll tell you they don't like that the system costs so much. That's the single biggest thing they don't like. What is, it, what is the single biggest thing that you don't like about the Spanish healthcare system? By the way, this is not national cost. This is the cost to me out of my wallet. So why did you say fundamental change and not not minor change. I'll show you in a second what people in Spain say. I'm sorry? Access. Access. Waiting lists. If you look at, <coughs> this is a somewhat broader uh, country survey of satisfaction with healthcare systems. There's Spain and the United States kissing cousins, as it were. Um, people are happiest in Denmark and the least happy in Greece. I guess that may be a fundamental trait of the Greeks, huh? Um, uh, but th there's uh, actually a, a fair amount of variation. This is um, showing you what's happened over time in Spain. As a whole, only about a quarter of people in Spain are happy with the healthcare system, so that's roughly in line with other countries. Um, most people believe that fundamental changes are needed, although depending on the survey, about 15 to 25 percent of people um, believe that the Spanish healthcare system needs to be completely rebuilt. Actually, people are slightly happier in Spain in 2006 than they are in 1991. So there's a little bit of improvement there, although the rates are not that high. Um, I was a little bit uh, interested in this. It does not vary an enormous amount across parts of Spain. So it's not that there's some parts of Spain where people are extremely happy and other parts of Spain where they're not. I don't know whether you would have guessed that, but I was just sort of interested to, to um, see that. But if you ask what is it that people in Spain do not like, what shows up about 20 different ways is waiting times. What shows up over and over again, item number one, waiting times. Item number two, waiting times for specialists. Item number three, waiting times for operations. Item number four, waiting times for family doctors. Item number something or another, waiting time for exam. Waiting time in emergencies. Two fundamental issues here. This is um, showing you that it's not just about Spain. If you look at... Um, People, uh, have you had an unmet medical need in the past year? People in Canada, some people say yes. People in the U.S., some people say yes. <clears throat> in the U.S., the reason why people don't have their medical needs yet met is because they can't afford it. In Canada, the reason why they don't have their medical needs yet is because they had to wait too long for it. So there are really two sides of a coin here, and what I want to argue is that they're actually intimately related which is that the U.S. and Europe have chosen two different models. <clears throat> One model says we will spend a lot, and in exchange there will be many fewer waiting lines, but there's the possibility that you'll bankrupt yourself. The other model is we won't spend as much. You will not bankrupt yourself, but you will worry about will you really get access when you need it. Every country that we have falls on one side of this or the other. The U.S. falls over here. Europe falls over there. The question that I really want to ask, and neither one is perfect. People in Spain are not stunningly happy, although they're happier in the U.S. People in Europe as a whole are not stunningly happy. Everyone thinks there are problems. The real question is, is there an answer to those problems? That is, what do we know about what the ideal health care system would look like? Would it be the U.S. model? Would it be the Spanish model or the European model? Would it be something different from either of those two? 
So that's really what I want to ask is, how do you get out of this box where you either spend too much and people are unhappy because they're going to go bankrupt, or you spend too little and people are unhappy because they're not going to get the services that they want? Um, the U.S., I believe, is embarking on an experiment that may give an answer to that, or certainly will give some answer, whether it's the, an answer that we like or not. So I want to tell you a little bit about the philosophy for what's guiding health care, health reform in the United States, and how it speaks to that issue about what would the ideal health care system look like. In the U.S., what's going on is two things. Number one is we passed a law two years ago that if it goes into effect as enacted, will cover essentially all Americans, so bringing the United States up to the level of most civilized countries, um, including Spain in a set of civilized countries. Um, so, uh, so that's the first part. It's a uniquely American thing that we haven't done that. I actually don't want to speak very much about that. Instead, what I want to do is talk about what is a sort of somewhat quieter revolution in the U.S., which is a fundamental change in the nature of what it means to practice medicine. And it's this change that I want to think about as having perhaps the biggest impact on the cost and the quality and the access issues in healthcare. And so I want to, sort of, I want to explain it to you. And I want to speak most heavily about the cost-quality trade-off. I want you to focus most heavily on the cost-quality trade-off. So I've given you a, down here as succinct a statement of what American health economists believe about medical care costs in the United States as there is. And I actually want to ask whether you believe this about Spain. So I've done this survey of American audiences. So the statement is medical care costs too much and delivers too little. Okay? And when you do this survey of American audiences, about 90% of Americans will agree with this. To a completely informal survey, about 90% of Americans will agree with this. So the question is, do you agree with this about Spain? Medical care costs too much and delivers too little. How many agree with it? <laughs> Approximately one out of N. <laughs> Maybe two. How many disagree? How many agree with the delivers too little part? How many agree with the costs too much part? So people here believe it doesn't cost enough and delivers too much. <laughs> the US, we have the opposite problem. And so let me tell you a little bit about why. We've actually tried, economists have tried to put some numbers on this. Our best guess in the United States is that about one third of medical spending is for services that are not necessary. The U.S. spends close to two and a half trillion dollars a year on medical care. So that is a wasting about 800 billion dollars a year or so on medical services that aren't doing much good. Hmm. Someone earlier this morning, I will not implicate him, suggested that he thought in Spain it was about 20%. So how do you spend a third? Well, you deliver care very poorly. You, give, you have unnecessary services. You don't deliver care the right way. I want to talk a little bit more about some of these. You don't coordinate care well. Sometimes excessive prices. In the US, we focus a lot on pharmaceutical prices, although the prices paid for typical diagnostic and imaging things vary enormously across facilities as well. Administrative costs, this is one of our favorite ones in the U.S. We have enormous administrative costs, much more than other countries do. And then we have some good old-fashioned fraud and abuse, um, which I actually won't talk very much about. But I want to show you how, to con how at least I conceptualize this. This is um, uh, one person's humorous depiction of the U.S. medical care system. This was, you know, please describe in one slide or less what the U.S. medical care system looks like. <laughs> So this was one person's depiction of that. We will now proceed by going through each box one by one. Um, this was a different depiction of it. There was a movie that was Michael Moore, who's a sort of documentary, very, very left of center film producer who made a movie called Sicko, What Seems to Be the Problem. That's a different depiction. Here is mine, and here's the way I want to think about all healthcare systems. People basically start off life fairly healthy. And then they develop various chronic illnesses. 
and then oftentimes those illnesses lead to acute events. So think about someone who develops uh, high blood pressure, and then they ultimately have a stroke or a heart attack, something like that. And what happens is they get medical services at various points along the path. Almost all medical spending is when people are very, very sick. So in the U.S., that's between, I don't know, a half and, and, and two-thirds or three-quarters of medical spending is when people are very, very sick. We don't spend an enormous amount treating people when they're chronically ill or even when they're healthy. Um, other countries, probably the ratio is somewhat higher, but in absolute terms, the, the dollars spent on people when they're when they're relatively healthy is not that great, or when they're chronically ill but not acutely ill is not that great. What medical systems focus on a lot is when people are very ill, and, in, and then they sort of put them into boxes. So there's a box for primary care, a box for specialists and hospitals and pharmaceuticals and all sorts of things like that. So when you study the U.S., what do we observe about the healthcare system? One thing we observe is that people use way too much care when they're very ill. If you, look at the, if you look at those figures between the U.S. and Europe and you say, what is the U.S. spending on that Europe is not spending on? One of the very big categories is care when people are very sick. Okay? So you're much more likely to get any kind of intensive service episode, much more likely to get um, wasteful end-of-life care. All sorts of stuff is much more common in the U.S. than it is in other countries. And it varies across European countries as well. The high-spending countries will do much more of this than the low-spending countries will. That's what all the waiting lines are about, is this sort of stuff. So there's enormous amounts of excess spending here. I would be very surprised if there isn't excess spending in Spain in this as well. Uh, second is we're very bad, as most countries are very bad, at preventing acute illness. So people, we know how to control, um, oh, we've known how to control high blood pressure since the 1950s. So there are drugs that do it. They, you can buy a drug for about 20 cents per pill, one pill a day, so about 20 cents a day to control blood pressure. No more than one in three Americans are successfully treated. And as best I can tell, that's pretty universal. If you look at what share of people get their recommended tests for diabetes or for any other kind of chronic disease, you don't find very high rates anywhere in the world. You occasionally find them in countries like the UK or the Netherlands where they've explicitly taken them out of the medical model, which is there's a primary care doctor, there's a specialist, and so on, and they assign particular people whose job it is to reach out to folks and say, we're going to help you manage your, um, your chronic disease you know, through nurse or some other kind of out-of-the-box out of intervention. The countries that have the most traditional medical systems do very poorly at managing chronic disease. Why? It's very hard to do. People find it very difficult to figure out how to control their life so that it works out for them, so that they can do this. After all, that's how they got this, these diseases in the first place. So it's very, very difficult for people to do that. The third thing is, uh, in the U.S., which I won't talk very much about for this audience, is um, uh, our administrative costs. We, um, the, the most common occupation in the U.S. healthcare system is not doctor and it's not nurse, it's office support. So these are people whose job it is to submit claims for reimbursement and make sure they get reimbursed and all of that sort of stuff. We run the world's most inefficient system for healthcare of anything you can possibly design. Let me come back to this for a second. Let's take someone who has diabetes. Is what they really want as an economic matter to see their primary care physician? Is what they really want to get advice from a specialist? In fact, that's not what they want at all. What people want, if you think in the broadest sense about what is the good here, so go back to your principles of economics, people want to buy a good. What is the good here? The good is actually treatment of a particular condition, whether it's a chronic disease like diabetes, an acute episode like a stroke, a healthy person who wants to maintain their health over their lifetime. What people actually want, this is the most fundamental um, thing I think I will tell you, is that medical care systems are organized completely wrong because they are organized around the specific intervention 
And the specific intervention is not what people want. What people want is to get better or to maintain their health. Someone once said that only an economist thinks that a colonoscopy is a benefit. <laughs> that may only make sense for older people. <laughs> Nobody wants a specific treatment. What they want is to be healthy. Here's the basic problem. Here's the economic problem as clearly as it can be stated. What we pay for is not what people want. What we pay for is specific treatments that people receive and what they want is to get better. And the gaps in countries where people are unhappy is where those two don't mesh, is where the specific treatment is not what people need or the specific treatment is what people need but the money isn't there. And so the only way to get out of this box is going to be to make the money follow what you really want it to follow, which is people getting better or maintaining their health. So most fundamentally, my sense is that this market is, people are unhappy because the market is not actually structured the right way. It's not structured around the principle of give people what they want. What I want to do is show you examples of that and talk about how, that, um, how that's playing out in the U.S. context and how it might play out elsewhere. So I just want to give you a couple of examples about some of these discrepancies. And, and there, there, there are a few areas. I'll talk first about um, mistakes, out, outright mistakes. Then I'll talk particularly about, the mo I think, the thing that's most important, which is about how to streamline operate, uh, the operations of the system to do better. Um, and then finally some issues on customer service. We have done a lot of research in the U.S. on medical errors. It's our guess in the U.S. that out of a population of 300 million people, we have about 1.7 million hospital healthcare associated infections, typically, ho typically people getting infections in a hospital because of something the hospital did or didn't do. By the way, anyone here thinking of going to medical school? What's the most common thing that you do or don't do to give people an infection? You don't wash your hands. Very, very simple intervention. This costs the U.S. 30 to 40 billion dollars annually dealing with this. I haven't seen any data from other countries. I'd be surprised if infection rates aren't higher than people would guess they would be. We know you can essentially drive these to zero. How do you drive them to zero? By the way, if you did a survey of doctors and you said, should you wash your hands every single time, what will they tell you? 100% of them will say yes. So why don't they? They don't get infected. <laughs> Why don't they? It's not what the system focuses on in any way. It's nice to do, but if you forget, there's nothing reminding you. Actually, for most healthcare institutions, giving someone an infection is quite lucrative because you get paid for treating the infection. <laughs> I don't think that's why they do it, but that's certainly related to why they don't push harder on getting rid of them. So here's an example. We know how to get rid of these. There was a checklist that was developed by a researcher at Johns Hopkins. This is how do you reduce um, infections associated with inserting a central line into the patient. That's where you put, you know, it, put in food or various kinds of nutrition or monitor blood gases or whatever it is. It's a fairly quick thing. You make sure you always do it 100% of the time. Think about this as a manufacturing process. You want the process to work, so you standardize the process around what works. Standardize the process around what works. There was an actual clinical trial where they did an intervention to decrease um, bloodstream infections in the ICU. They started off with a bunch of hospitals in Michigan. They then got them to do their intervention. And what they discovered is that they got their infection rate down from 2.7 to zero. And you can keep it at zero. You can sustain it there. Nobody is unhappy as a result. You just follow the standard procedures. And the whole point about the system is it's not set up to do this. Because it doesn't think about the care experience, which is, did we treat this patient successfully every single time? 
It's set up to think about, did I operate the correct way? Did I do the, the thing in the ICU? If the infection happens after the operation, the doctor's not around, there's no coordination, there's nothing there that says, did I do this right for this patient 100% of the time? The money is not following doing it right, the money is following doing the thing. Let me give you another example. Um, let me skip to, um, sorry. Um, let me give you, an, let me give you a, a, one example, another example here. How many of you um, have had someone in your family have lower back pain? Okay. Um, now this might be a little bit different in Spain versus in the U.S., um, but let me ask you the question anyways. So raise your hand again if, you had, if you've had someone in your family with lower back pain. Okay. Now, keep, wait, wait, no, keep your hands up for one second. How many, of, how many um, saw an orthopedist for the lower back pain? Okay. Mostly that was useless. How many... Uh, received an MRI or some other kind of image on the back. That was useless too. Anyone have back surgery? That was useless also. In the United States, we spend $90 billion a year treating lower back pain. And if you look at the guidelines, easily half of that doesn't need to occur. Like literally, the studies show that there's no benefit to seeing the orthopedist, there's no benefit to the image, there's no benefit to the surgery. Why do people go to the orthopedist, get an image, and get surgery? And in Spain, too. Because that's the way the system is set up. That's the way it thinks. It thinks about I'm an orthopedist, what I do is I see people with musculoskeletal problems. This person has a musculoskeletal problem, I see them. And just to figure out what's going on, I image them. And then when I discover something wrong on the image, it turns out if you, if you image healthy backs, you find just as many problems as if you image people with back pain. <laughs> it's true, they've done you do clinical studies on this and you find just as many problems. And when you see something wrong in the image, you decide to operate on them depending on the resource availability. So the net effect is that the U.S. spends at least 50% more than we need to on that condition. I'm not sure how much more other countries spend, but it would surely be a lot as well. What we know is that for a lot of these kinds of conditions, lower back pain, mental illness, breast health, migraines, all of that, there are clinical guidelines, and those clinical guidelines, the doctors will universally tell you they agree with them, and when you look in any set of data, they universally do not follow them. And the reason why is because haphazard is the way the system works, because the system is not focused on, did we do the right thing for, this, for these people all the time? Let me just show you an example. This chart here, which I won't really go into any detail on, shows you a typical pathway that you can find. This is for treatment of bipolar illness, so this is manic depression. You start off with people who get a diagnosis. You then put them on various medications. If they're recovering, you continue there. If they're not recovering, you change the course of things, and you um, then work towards what is the goal down at the bottom, which is complete recovery of the patient. Okay. You can put these together. Every clinician will agree with them, and I guarantee you in Spain, although I've not seen any data, but I guarantee you in Spain that the adherence to the guidelines is not high, and I know for a fact that in the United States, adherence to the guidelines is not high. And the reason is that they're not what the system focuses on. If you look, we could save enormous amounts of money if we just did it right. I'd be willing to bet it's the same in Spain, although obviously I don't know for sure. So the, so the question is then, how do you get it right? How do, what does it mean to try and integrate them all into a care experience? 
Let me go outside of healthcare for a minute and tell you what it means to try to, into, to, try to make systems work well. It turns out, uh, this is not a, a, a field where I've done a lot of research, but, I, but it's a field where I've read some, so I'll tell you a little bit about the research. If you look at every big firm, every successful big firm, every big firm that has high profits, that has very high quality, <coughs> satisfied workers, and so on, and you say, what do they do that makes that, what, do th what are the components of those firms that make them be successful? There are only three components, and it's true about every successful firm. And so we're going to have to deal with them in healthcare if we want healthcare to be successful. Number one, they have information systems in place. Every successful firm knows how much it costs to do different things, who should do them, how much they're spending doing it, how you should streamline it. So for example, where the orthopedist sees the person for the lower back pain and the orthopedist is useless there, the right firm would say, why are we having orthopedists see these people? In fact, the right thing to do is most people with lower back pain should just go straight to physical therapy, which is much cheaper, um, actually better for the patient too. The U.S. has been very, very bad at having these information systems in place. We've got very, very poor records. We're just starting to do them. We're now spending $30 billion a year on this. Now, how many of your records are electronic in Spain? 90%. So how many of you have an electronic medical record? Yeah? So if you went to a hospital in Madrid, would they be able to pull up your record? <laughs> it turns out that they have electronic medical records. It turns out they have electronic medical records in Iraq, but not in Spain or the United States. So if I go to a hospital or a doctor that's not my usual doctor, there's no way they can access my information. So the, so the first thing is getting the right information in place. And that's something that every country, every system is going to have to spend money on. Okay? It's an upfront investment that we're going to need because you never, ever do better without knowing what you're doing. So that's item number one. Item number two is you have to change the money flows. If you want people, if you want the care providers, the doctors and nurses and so on, to focus on treating people well, you should have the money be based on treating people well, not based on seeing the person and not some global payment that says independent of however many people you see. So the biggest revolution is likely to be here in the U.S. Well, the, the information stuff too, but here in the U.S., trying to completely change payment systems so that they say do well rather than just do more. In a European context, it would be do well rather than make do with what you have. The third big thing is they're very, very decentralized. All big firms, all successful firms are very decentralized in what they do. So they all go to the employees and even the customers and say, help us figure out how to do better. People with back pain, lower back pain, what should we do to make them get better faster and save money? Invariably, if you go to a, 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 a medical care organization in the US and you ask them, can you think of ways to improve the quality of what you do and lower the cost? They'll be stunned that you ask. And then they'll say yes, and they'll pretty soon come up with about 20 or 30 ideas. If you then say, how come you haven't implemented those ideas? They'll tell you that nobody's ever asked them for their ideas. So we run entire systems without ever figuring out how to do better. In the U.S., we're going to spend $30 billion wiring the medical system so we can figure out what to do when a particular patient comes into a doctor's office, which drugs are more effective than which other drugs, which surgeries are more effective than others, which doctors are better at doing a particular thing than other doctors are. It is amazing the variability in quality. The rates of mortality for bypass surgeons in the U.S., people who cut open your chest and wire your 
around your heart. The, the mortality rate on the operating room table varies by a factor of 10, from the best to the worst. And you cannot figure out who is best and who is worst before you go get your operation. So enormous variation. The other thing we're likely to do is change payments. So if you want people to get healthy after they've had an acute event, just give them amount, an amount of money for that. What I think will happen in the U.S. is that money will increasingly just follow the patient, not what's done. Let me give you a specific example. You have a patient with a stroke who shows up in a hospital. They need some hospital care, some specialist care, pharmacies and labs, some post-acute care, and so on. We currently pay for all of those separately, and thus we get problems like errors and mistakes and stuff like that. Just give one amount of money to whoever can care for the patient with a stroke. Whoever wants to take charge of that money, you take charge of it, you pay for all of the services and coordinate across those services. If the patient comes back in the hospital because they are um, not well managed after they leave the hospital, that's going to be someone's loss of revenue. If you can figure out how to deal with the patient well so that they don't need so many services, you get to keep money. So you say there's going to be a fixed amount, not dependent on what you do. There's going to be a fixed amount. Uh, it'll vary with the quality, so the better your patients do, the more, of, the more we'll pay you or the more you'll get to keep of any savings, but it's not going to vary based on what's done. Money follows the good that you want, which is the person getting better. Or we're, we're also doing this for the patient as a whole. There are now a number of situations in the U.S. where what happens is medical groups get paid to manage people as a whole and they bear all the risk for the services that they use. So if they can figure out how to keep their diabetic patients from showing up with a heart attack, they can make money. If they can figure out how to manage people so that they don't need post-acute services or so that they, they, they take their medications, then they'll do very well. You come up with quality metrics that you hope do a good enough job so that these folks don't want to never see anybody but you don't pay them more for doing any more. You make the money follow the good that you want, which is caring for the patient better. In this model, the decisions and a good deal of the risk are actually borne not by insurance companies, but by providers. And one of the things about the United States is that I think we are moving towards a model which is a little bit like a European model, where you've basically dispensed with private insurance companies for the basic benefits, and you're, the, the government's running the system, and then really imposing whatever risk on the providers through some kind of fixed budget. And the U.S. is working its way there, although, as I said, slightly differently, because it won't be a fixed budget at the institution level. It'll be at the patient. It'll be a target at the patient level. But basically, it's eliminating an intermediary, which is an insurance company that's, in fact, not doing very much to help people manage their utilization. And saying, let's get the decision-making authority and the risk that goes along with that into the hands of the, of the organization that really does the most here, which is providing, which is providing the medical services. So that is kind of the model that is going on in the US. Um, lest you think that we economists are nuts, I will give you two quotes from famous economists, just to justify myself. The first is by Herb Stein. Does everyone know who Herb Stein was? Yes, raise your hand if you know Herb Stein. No? Herb Stein was a famous conservative economist, uh, worked at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington. Um, he wrote once uh, a very prophetic statement, that's Herb over here, uh, if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. I know, it's a very profound statement. He wasn't specifically referring to health care, but of course that's what he could have meant, which is that if you can't keep going on spending forever, you won't keep going on spending forever. Um, and so that's the, the, that's the issue. Of course, the, you could apply that in the European context, which is if people are increasingly concerned about waiting lines, you can't have them be increasingly, increasingly concerned over time. The second is by a famous economist named Jerry Garcia. Has anybody ever heard of this economist? Yes? Okay, this, so this I apologize. I wasn't sure how well this would go over. Um, does anyone know, any, look familiar to anybody? Anybody ever hear of the band The Grateful Dead? Okay, so that's who he is. But he actually said something more profound than most economists, 
which is that somebody has to do something, and it's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. Now, here's why this is relevant. We are in a time of huge crises. There's the economic crisis in Europe, there's the crisis going on in the US and states and across um, Asia and so on. And then there are these underlying crises about budget problems and long-term structural issues. And the question is, who is going to do something? Somebody has to do something. It is kind of pathetic that it has to be us, but nonetheless, that's where it has fallen. And so I think it has fallen into the lap, in this case, of economists to try and help come up with something that says, how can we make this thing stop going on the same way it has? And if we do that, we will have really solved one of the great public policy challenges of our era, which is trying to figure out how to put the public money on a solid foundation across the world. And if we can't, then all the crises that we're having now are just going to be magnified in the future when governments don't have the resources to spend on something that people want and you get increasing levels of frustration um, and markets just not working well at all. So there's a pessimistic version. I prefer to be the optimist mostly because it's more fun than being a pessimist, but I'm not sure I have any reason to otherwise believe that optimism is the right policy here. I think there will be a revolution. I hope that it works out well. Those are at least the thoughts about how in the US we're kind of approaching what is one of the fundamental economic issues of our time, which is how do you design a market that would work well. So I want to stop here. I want to take questions um, either about the US or I'm happy to comment on any aspect of Spain that is inappropriate for me to talk about. <laughs> including separation and all sorts of things like that that I know nothing about. <laughs> but I just want to open it up for, um, uh, for questions or, or, or comments. And, and please, uh, please uh, speak loudly and introduce yourselves. Okay. I'm Jose Garcia Montalvo. I'm a professor of economics at the department. Uh, you didn't touch on the issue of legal suits and legal demands and the effect of that on the cost, on the, this very high cost in the U.S., which is kind of very different of the setup in other countries. Is that uh, an, an issue that is important? And with your focus on persons instead of acts, would yeah. that solve that problem? One of the, yes, it's a great question. So in the U.S., you know, if you do the wrong thing, you'll get sued. If you do the right thing, you'll get sued. If you do anything, you'll get sued. If you do nothing, you'll get sued. So more or less, there's a kind of lawsuit issue that floats around here. W one of the ways where that shows up is when you go to the, um, when you go to the, the, the orthopedist and say, you know what, you don't need to see all these patients with lower back pain. You just don't need to see them. Um, and here's a better pathway. That is, when they call and it's clear it's just localized lower back pain, they should go to physical therapy and so on. First thing they'll say is, yeah, great, but one person won't get better and they'll sue me. And so it really creates this hesitancy to engage in thinking about how do you really streamline what you're doing? How do you do what you're doing well? So the U.S. will need to address that. It, it actually turns out when you go ahead and do that, when you go ahead and say, let's cut out the orthopedist, let's cut out the MRI and so on, and let's do a streamlined care path, it turns out the patients are actually happier and they sue less. But they don't believe that ex ante. The, nobody believes that ex ante. So I, so I think it's a key issue, but it's um, more an issue about how do you motivate people to want to do the right thing than it is a substantively big economic issue about driving an enormous amount of, of, of cost. Yes, Paolo Ibella from the Autonoma of Barcelona. Um, my question is on the role of insurers. I really didn't quite get your point there because I thought they would be the best ones to discipline the, the providers. And as long as you people choose their health plan, that would be like a main ingredient in the good system. Yeah. It's, um, I will, uh, it's a great question. And this is, to me, one of the great puzzles of health economics, which is the following. This is a really complicated system. If you think about dealing with any disease, it's enormously complicated. You know, how do I manage my diabetes? What's the right 
combination of primary care inputs, specialty in inputs, pharmacy inputs, labs, when do I get them, and so on, dynamically, and all of that. So it's a very complicated production process. And the question is, how should we go about designing that production process when it's clear that people on their own can't combine all the inputs? So who's sort of in charge of this? And your obvious answer would be that the insurance company is the right organization to be in charge of this because they can sort of figure out what the, in essence, what the marginal cost of the different inputs is and, and, and align them appropriately. And yet, no insurance company more or less anywhere has done that. So instead, all they've done is they've kind of focused on bearing risk, you know, collecting premiums from people and paying it out to these folks based on what they said they did and some negotiated fee schedule. And in the process, just antagonizing both the people who they're collecting money from and the people who they're paying. So it's a business model that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What you're starting to see in the United States are some insurance companies saying, maybe we ought to think about coming in and helping people and being the navigator in the same way that many banks are a navigator for your savings money or retirement vehicles or something like that where you can invest them and they'll help you invest them and they'll work for you and take your money to do that. So you're starting to see that, but, by, but what's also happening even faster than that is that most of our um, people who actually provide care say, you know what, we'll just organize it ourselves. We'll come together in big groups and figure out how to manage these people, and we don't even need the insurance company. And so it's really a race between will, will the insurers figure out how to do this faster, or will they be disintermediated out of this before they have a chance to really be there? And my personal betting, which is kind of what I was saying here, is that they just won't get there fast enough. And so people will just say, why am I paying 10 or 15% for a service that I don't even like that's not even doing anything? But it's a really, really fascinating issue about how come nobody has ever actually done this. Um, I'm a student in master's in Barcelona Graduate School of Economics, Economics Public Policy. And I guess I have a sum up question of how you would then define a sustainable health um, policy or health system. Thank you. How would, it's a very good question. How would one define a sustainable health care system? Um, let me come back a little bit to, I asked you the question, I guess I'm going back a lot, aren't I? I asked you the question, which of these two lines is right, the US line or the, the Europe line, and you all chose Europe. Now, Europe may not itself be sustainable here because the costs are increasing relative to the economy and they're rising more rapidly than, um, uh, than tax revenue to the government, and so it's got a big problem there. Um, I would say that this, that, a sustainable system would actually have two features. One is it wouldn't waste resources, which the U.S. does, and I believe a lot of other countries do as well, which means effectively that this number would come down to here or below, even. And second, that it would be continually striving to get better. And those two are actually somewhat different. Some firms are really good, but they just stay there. Toyota was a very, very widely admired company for its manufacturing high quality, low cost cars, and then it just deteriorated by not keeping up. So those would be the hallmarks of a good system. Now, but even once you have that, it's not, it's not obvious that the cost won't go up more over time because we, there are always things that we might want to develop to help improve our, our bodies and, and live to longer ages. In which case, a sustainable system will have some financing built in that rises more rapidly than the economy. But we're so far from the efficient point that, at least in the US, we tend not to worry about that so much anymore. 
that is the spending gap between where we are and where it should be is so great that people say let's spend the next 15 years just getting to be reasonable and then we'll think about how to deal with what comes after that. So the, I, I, the U.S. is probably on a kind of 15, hopefully on something like a 15 year path to get to be a, a, well, a good or a better functioning system. I suspect that other countries will need to do that. Again, not, costs won't need to fall as much, but they'll need to reorient around thinking about what it is that they really want. I'm Hari. Um, I'm a student at the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics. My question is, you were saying that information should be freely available, but the problem is individual providers have a strong incentive to not provide it because if a hospital makes its records freely available, it's easy for a patient to shift away. Yep. Now, do you see an alternative to a government making it mandatory to provide information and providing the necessary infrastructure? This is because I come from India. If you need to make the uh, medical records of one billion people available, you'll probably need as many servers as Google. So. Um, thank you. Information is in many ways a public good. It costs money to bring it all together and disseminate it, and it's not in any single organization's interest to pay that money. So one way or the other, governments have an enormous say in the information. In the US, what we're saying is, for that $30 billion, we're going to require certain things of it. So we're not just going to give you the money to put in medical records that you do whatever you want with, but you're going to have to be able to share the data and stuff like that. Most other countries have various rules about information gathering and provision and dissemination, some of which are good rules, some are bad, but they've all, it, it sort of shows up on the public agenda everywhere. So I, I think this is one of the kind of public good issues that, um, that, that countries are going to, are going to, all countries are going to have to deal with. Yes, ma'am. Um, hello, my name is Marisol Rodriguez from the University of Barcelona. Uh, going back to your chart, your complete chart, where you have the patient, uh, the person who is healthy, mm -hmm. then maybe becomes unhealthy and gets all these services, primary care, mm -hmm. hospital care, labs, pharmacy. My question is, why don't we do more to keep people healthy? Let me actually take a survey of this room for a second. I'm curious about what you'll say about the Spanish healthcare system. So the question is, um, grade on a, you know, I really like it, it's okay, it's bad. Three parts of the Spanish healthcare system. How it deals with people when they're very sick, how it deals with people when they're chronically ill, and how it deals with them when they're healthy. Okay? So, it, so I'll just do, uh, let me just do two. It's, it's, it's good or it's bad, okay? So the red part, it's, how many say it's good? How many say it's bad? Okay, relative to that, the chronic illness part, how many would say it's the same or better? How many would say it's worse? Okay. Also relative to that first part, the healthy person, how many would say it's the same or better? How many would say it's worse? What we have here is an example, and I would guess that's true of every system, which is that every system is much better here than it is here. And I think the reason is that this involves much more coordination between the patient and the doctor, between the different doctors, and that coordination is what is most lacking. If you go back to the countries that do better, they're the ones that have cut through the lack of coordination by assigning people the job of coordinating. And that's what good organizations in the U.S. do, that's what good organizations around the world do, is they say, when coordination is a problem, assign someone whose job it is to help coordinate. Here, there's the coordination happens more readily. You're in the hospital, so you're there, and so people kind of come by and do stuff. 
Now, it's, not, it's still not greatly coordinated, but it's a little bit easier to do. The more you get into issues of distance, of physical distance and distance across time, the harder it is to do that. And that's why I'm not surprised that every system does poorly here. But it's not the case that every single system everywhere does badly. If you look at retirement planning, it's a very complicated issue to make sure your money gets from your employers in your paycheck to where it needs to be for retirement planning. And there are entire firms that specialize in doing that. And they often do it very well because they've figured out how to coordinate it. And that's their job is to figure out how to run this. That's how they make their money. So it's unique in healthcare that the system hasn't done it. And I think it's largely because that's the way there have been, never been any incentives to do that. Good morning. I'm a student for the BGSC Economic Master. And I wanted to ask, do you think that it would be possible for firms or companies or broadly speaking employers to make a significant contribution or playing a positive role as for the way they provide assistance or counseling to, the, uh, to their employees in order to improve the, the overall satisfaction with their personal care, health care? Thank you. Um, yes, the, the question is who else can be involved in this? And one uh, group that could be involved is an employer. Employers benefit when their people are healthier because they're more productive. They use less medical spending in, in parts of the world where employers pay for medical spending. Um, they also take less time off of work. The workers are happier. They might accept a lower wage to work at a job like that. So there are all sorts of reasons why employers might feel they want to be involved. It's been, um, in the US, there's a lot of discussion about how involved should employers be in this. And they never get too involved because they, it, they sort of don't know what to do. Let me contrast again health planning, that is managing your health, with financial planning, managing your money. So if an employer in the US wants to help you with financial planning, they go to Fidelity or Vanguard or a company like that. And they say, please come in and help manage the money for our employees. And then they'll do that and they'll pay them a fee and you know, they'll take it all out and so on. Whereas here, there's nobody that actually does that, that really provides that service. And it's sort of ironic because it is the thing that is most noticeable, at least to Americans, which is that the system is just too complicated to use. And it's clearly coming through in some of your answers as well, though the waiting list issue is a bigger issue in Spain. But it's clearly coming through, which is that nobody has figured out how to run this. Now, to be fair, health planning is far more technically hard to do than financial planning. But it's not impossible to do. And there are you know, technological and human resource ways of doing it that would work very well. Uh, my name is Sean Kite. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I study economics here. Um, I have a question about Obamacare. According to its goals, do you think it has been successful? And if not, do you think it needs more time? Obamacare. Everybody, how many people have heard the phrase Obamacare? Okay, so the law that passed in 2010 is affectionately and unaffectionately called Obamacare. <laughs> Someone once suggested it should be called Cutler Care since I worked for Obama helping to develop it, but I wasn't sure I, I, wasn't sure I quite liked that. Um, I think the person who said that really didn't like it also, which is why they suggested that. It was a very um, contentious issue in the U.S. So the U.S. population, since the law was passed, the U.S. population has been absolutely 100% split. About 40% of, of Americans will tell you they like the law, and if anything, it didn't go far enough. About 40% of Americans will tell you they think it's the devil come to life, and it's taking away every last ounce of freedom, and it's going to destroy the basic fabric of American society. 
And then about 15 to 20 percent of Americans don't even know there was such a law. <laughs> and they have no idea what it, mean, what it says or what it does or how it affects them or anything like that. So um, what do you do about that? Well, for starters, most of the law hasn't gone into effect yet. So the coverage, covering people will start in 2014. A lot of the other things are being phased in over time, which was a little bit of a mistake because that gave us four years of nonstop fighting over it, which I just can't tell you how much fun that is. Um, so some of it is that it hasn't gone into effect yet, but a lot of it is that people have different ideological points of view in the U.S., and it's just hard to bridge those. What supporters of the law hope is that it will be like um, Social Security, which is our old age insurance, Medicare and Medicaid, which are our attempts at universal, at universal coverage for some groups, poor people and elderly people. By which you mean that nobody understood what those were when they were first passed, but once they came into effect, people saw them and liked them. So there's a view that Americans just can't think through anything this complex. No human being could think through anything this complex, and you just have to wait and see it work, and then people will see it work and like it. There's the, the view on the other side is that um, I don't, I mean, obviously I like it because I worked for him and I helped design it, so I'm not, I'm going to do a better job of the side that I agree with than the other side. But the, the view on the other side is that um, the thing will collapse because it really won't be able to save money and we couldn't afford it and people don't want the government in the U.S. to be that involved in this part of their life. So it's just going to fail anyways, and wouldn't it be better to fail before it's substantially gone into effect than after it's substantially gone into effect? So uh, we will continue to fight it out. Um, our election coming up next month will be a very, very big deal because if the president wins re-election, there's no chance the law will be repealed. And if the Republicans, uh, Mitt Romney wins the president, um, he will push for the law to be repealed, whether it will be or it won't. We don't quite know. So it'll be, but that'll be, in some sense, the end point for will the law actually really go into effect. It will not be the end point for what will Americans think about it. That's going to take quite a number of additional years before Americans really have a firm view about it. Hi, my name is Adam Ayton. Where, where are you, Adam? Right here. Okay. <laughs> I'm in the Health Economics um, Master Program at the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics. And what I want to ask you about is technological innovation. So I think in economics, usually there's an assumption that whenever there's a problem, technology will come and save the day, that productivity will um, magically appear, things will scale, everything will be great. Uh, however, in healthcare, back in, I think it was 2008, the Congressional Budget Office um, under Peter Orzag found that this reason in healthcare, the advent of um, health innovation technologies, is the main reason for the uh, increase in healthcare costs. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. Um, it's a fantastic question. So here's the, the theorem that I want to give you, which for which there are a number of practical examples. But the theorem is that technology in most industries is governed enormously by the incentives of the industry. So when, on the good side, when we implemented, we in the U.S. implemented um, uh, basically financial benefits for reducing pollution. Okay, through Clean Air Act amendments and stuff like that. What we saw was enormous innovation in ways to produce with less pollution. Getting rid of older plants, retrofitting them, developing entirely new ways of doing things, having, a, having utility companies come to your house and figure out how you can reduce energy utilization and so on. So we had enormous innovation in pollution reduction. In healthcare, all the incentives have been to just do more because that's what the incentives were. There was never any real incentive to figure out how to treat people well. There was never any real incentive to coordinate other than for the insurers who never did it and so on. And so that's the nature of the innovation that we had. What all economists believe is that the 
innovation will respond to the incentives. Or to put it a different way, the single most important thing I think that we have learned in health economics in the past two decades is that the supply of the medical sector is incredibly responsive to price. So before that, in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s, we learned that demand is extremely responsive to price. What we have now learned is that supply is, if anything, even more responsive to price than demand is. And so that encourages people like me to say that if you get the prices better, you will do, you will do much better. The counterpart, of course, is that if you screw them up, you will screw things up much more. So it sort of, it, it makes it be really, really consequential how, how one goes about designing these systems. Hello, my name is Ainara and I'm studying international business economics here. And my question is, if medicine suppliers know more budget will be available, that may cause prices to rise. So my question is, what incentives could be implemented in order to prevent these prices from rising? Thank you. There is, um, boy, very, very good, good questions, comments. There is a debate among health economists in the US over the following issue. Is the healthcare market sufficiently screwed up that prices will never be a good guide because the demand side of the market is so weak and the patient's information is so limited that you're always going to have enormous monopoly or monopsony power and so prices are always going to be high and they need to be regulated? Or can you make, in essence, the demand side of the market work better or the overall reimbursement system work better so that someone really has an incentive to trade off across inputs and drive prices down. If you ask health economists in the US that question, could you get the market to work better or could you not get the market to work better, they wouldn't give you a very clear answer. Some people think that you can set up a market that would work better, whether through patient cost sharing or these kinds of bundled payments or so on. Some people think you can never get there and that in you're going to be hopelessly left regulating. Where the US has come out is various, since nobody really likes to do a lot of regulating in the US, or nobody professes to like to do a lot of regulating, where the US has come out is to say, let's try and get the markets to work better, and then once you do that, you don't need to regulate prices at all because the usual economic principles will affect them. But that is not, but people are not certain that's the case. And for things like pharmaceuticals and so on, there's still a strong residual of, okay, what am I going to do when there's a single drug to treat a life-threatening condition and the pharmaceutical company wants to charge $200,000 a year? Should I regulate that price or not? And an enormously large number of health economists say, yes, in at least some circumstances, I have to be prepared to regulate prices. But it's not something on which there is a single universal view of, of the community. Hi, Luis Ortiz. I'm studying Masters of uh, Health Economics in Barcelona Graduate School of Economics. And my question is more, what's the importance in the policy agenda of preventive care as a tool to do uh, the system, the health system, more sustainable. Sorry? Sorry. Just, just say one more sentence about what you're getting at with your question. Yes, I mean, I think that all, all this part of the financial sustainability for further years is more based in health care and not that much in preventive care. So what's like the importance? What's the role of, prevent, of prevention to make the financial system more, more sustainable in the future? Um, I got it now. At least I think I, I got it now. In, in the U.S., we often have a debate about how much money will prevention save. You know, we all agree we should invest in, so, the, so, so you sometimes see this debated as, would investing in prevention save money or would it just save lives? As if the, 
as if the saving lives wasn't good enough to, wasn't enough to, to, to justify it. Um, and it, it, we're sort of torn because sometimes when you prevent people from developing a particular illness, let's take smoking cessation. You can, we know there are ways to get people to stop smoking. Um, it turns out smoking is actually a fairly cheap way to die. Because lung cancer is not that expensive. There's just not enough time to do that much to the person, which in the US largely governs how much you can do, is how much time there is to do stuff. <laughs> and very few smokers ever develop Alzheimer's disease, because they just don't live long enough to develop it. <laughs> so, um, so, so in some cases, that prevention winds up costing money. I, it's, um, what we're looking for in the U.S., I, uh, this is a very bad analogy, but what we're looking for in the U.S. is to develop the kind of prevention care that turns people into light bulbs. Right, you know, light bulb, you know, you sort of put in your light bulb, it works, it works, it works, and then boom, it stops working. And that's it, then the light bulb is gone. Right, no one ever spent a euro repairing a light bulb. <laughs> right, but we spend a lot of euros repairing bodies that deteriorate gradually. So that's kind of the, in, in some sense, the goal here, which is, can you, can you make the human body be like a light bulb? And that, and, and that would be the part that really, really would save you uh, a lot. Now, although I focused on some of the things that do, like diabetes is a sort of good example where the consequences linger forever, or for a long time, and so that's very, very costly. But not everything is that way. You never wanted to think of yourself as a light bulb, but it's true. I think we have time for one or two additional questions. Okay, I'm Ariel Martinez, a student of economics, and I would like to know if making the person treated to pay a part of the cost of the treatment, known as copayment, is the solution for the uh, hole in the economic Spanish health system. Thank you. Well, let me ask you, uh, I would first want to ask you folks that question. <laughs> okay, so here's my question for you. Do you believe that copayments in the Spanish healthcare system should be substantially increased? And you, f you define in your m own mind what substantially means. Okay? So do you believe that copayments in the Spanish healthcare system should be substantially increased? So your, cho your possible choices are yes and no. <laughs> Okay, so how many say yes? How many say no? So I would, that looked like about 60% uh, no and 40% yes, if I were judging. In the U.S. context, we, there are a few different kinds of people who, a few different kinds of analysts. One type, uh, I've sort of given you one point of view. <laughs> There are other people who think we should go the European model and just regulate and put budgets on things. And then there's a, a share of people who believe that what we ought to have is very, very high copayments. And that people will then figure out how to use care well. The issue with doing that, the, the, one of the issues, and I suspect it was what some of the people who answered no were thinking here, is that people don't respond to copayments the way we would like them to. So let me give you an example. Remember all those diabetic things I was showing you about? So if you don't take your medication for diabetes, you'll wind up with heart attacks and <laughs> amputations and kidney failure and blindness and all sorts of other really bad things. And uh, based on health criteria, everybody should be rushing to their pharmacy on a daily basis to get their diabetes medications because the health consequences of not taking your medications are very severe. And yet, whenever you raise people's copayments, people stop taking their diabetes medications. In, in the U.S., the rough rule of thumb is that if you raise people's copayments by $10 a month for a drug, you know, take whatever drug they're taking, raise it by $10 a month, about 10% of people stop taking the drug. And so people are very, very nervous in the U.S. that if we had very high cost sharing, what we would have is an even worse record here and lots of people becoming ill because they just weren't 
smart enough to figure out that they should be willing to pay the extra amount. So it's, it's a vexing issue. I, I, um, I think some co-payments are reasonable, particularly if what they do is they say, there are two drugs, one generic, one branded. The generic is exactly the same efficacy as the branded, so there should be a really high copay on the branded one to get people to switch into the cheaper, exactly equivalent alternative. But just increasing, increasing copayments across the board, I worry about that a lot. Another way to say it is there's a relatively small literature in the U.S. on something called value-based insurance design which is basically trying to design an insurance plan that guides you to the right care, not just higher cost sharing or lower cost sharing across the board. And if we can make progress there, that'll be a very, very good thing to do. But in the absence of that, I, I'm quite cautious about it. Hello. Here. I'm Sophia, and I'm a student at the Master of you have Health to, You Economics. have to stand up so I can see where you are. Okay. Health Economics. And I was wonder, and I would want you to ask you a critical question, which is looking at the expenditure on healthcare uh, in the United States comparing to Europe. In your opinion, so uh, which one is more effective? Like, is it the national uh, health system or is it the market-oriented health system? Okay, so States? here's the. Here is the 4% uh, of GDP question. Would you pay 4% of GDP to live in the U.S. with the U.S. healthcare system? I'll tell you my answer, but first you have to tell me your answer while I stall for time. How many of you would be willing to pay 4% of GDP to live in, to get the U.S. healthcare system? How many of you would not? Okay, so if you gave me a choice of any European country compared to the U.S. healthcare system, I would certainly choose some of the European countries over the U.S. healthcare system. So in that sense, it's not justified. It's not clear to me that I would choose all European countries over the U.S. healthcare system. That is, there's some of the countries that are spending a fair amount where the systems really are not very good. So I, it's, not, it, it's not a single answer like that, but it's, but it's very clear that, that it is possible to do better. On the other hand, if you said to me, take what you hope will happen from the U.S. and say, will it be better than what Europe has now, or it, would it be or will it be fundamentally impossible to match the European record without going to a European kind, kind of system? My belief is that the U.S. will be able to do as well or better and that we won't have to go to a European kind of system. But if we're not going to do anything different, that's probably the kind of system I want. So that's a very evasive answer to the question. Última pregunta. Integrated package of care. It would drive up the quality, but if uh, demand is dependent on quality, it would go up even in an when the services are separate. And I don't see how it would drive down the price either because the price is dependent upon the price of the closest substitute. And because the closest substitute is a separate package, they would charge just as much. So I don't see how an integrated package would affect either quality or price. Thank you. Um, so it's sort of, it's a bit of a lengthier issue about how the pricing pays out, but I suppose the way to say it better would be the U.S. fundamentally has a model which is we like competition more than we like regulation. And so the question is can you set up some kind of competitive system where, you know, if you're better and cheaper you get more people and 
then use that to drive down the price. Now the real question is how good a market can you make can you make it out to be? Can how good a, can you make this market be? And I um, I hope it's pretty. I, I would guess it's pretty good. Although I'm reminded just since we're at the end, I'm reminded that the, the inaugural one of these lectures was by Ken Arrow. And Ken Arrow wrote a paper about how the fundamental problem with healthcare was that the information is imperfect. And so you can never get it right. And I suppose if there's another theme to what we've been talking about this morning, it's that over time, our ability to know the information has actually improved. So when he was writing in the 1960s, there was an uninformed patient dealing with a better informed physician and so on. And that was the fundamental asymmetry. And now there can be an extremely well-informed patient who's actually better informed than the doctor because they know both about the medicine and about the, the record of that doctor compared to other doctors and so on. So maybe the information has improved enough to where Ken Arrow wasn't wrong, but we can interpret him in a slightly different way. All of which is to say that hopefully there's another version of Ken's great paper to be written um, that someone in this audience will write in the very near future. Thank you very much. Students have to attend classes probably, so let's give one moment for people who want to, to leave out. Benvolguda Presidenta del Consell Social, Degà de la Facultat, Directora i futur director del Departament, directors dels centres de recerca i escoles de postgrau, patrocinadors, professors, estudiants. El director ha preguntat a mi de mantenir la seva representació en aquest event. Estic molt agradat de clarificar aquesta lliçó. La primera cosa que volia dir és que ha regretat molt que no ha pogut presentar aquest event. Ha ja passat en alguns altres eventos anteriors, però aquesta era la seva última vegada que ha pogut presentar la lliçó i adreçar aquesta audiència. And uh, uh, he regretted very much not having this, uh, uh, this last chance. Um, the message he asked me to uh, transmit to you can be summarized uh, in, in one word, uh, which is uh, acknowledgement. Um, uh, the university in this last uh, decade uh, has changed uh, significantly, has grown, uh, has uh, become much more internationalized. Um, has increased his, uh, its reputation, uh, uh, has uh, begun to figure prominently in international uh, rankings. And uh, in this uh, moment that uh, we end a cycle, of, uh, a cycle of government in our university, it's the right time uh, to uh, acknowledge and uh, to thank uh, the studies of uh, economics and business administration uh, for his important contribution uh, to, this, uh, to this process. Uh, during uh, two decades, all the university has uh, made a lot of uh, progress in achieving our uh, foundational uh, goals, uh, uh, attraction of talent, uh, quality and innovation in teaching, uh, internationalization, uh, transfer, all, all these uh, concepts that we have repeated so much have become a little bit of mantras. Um, 
and uh, in all uh, uh, indicators that uh, show the measure of achievement of uh, uh, these uh, goals, uh, the studies of uh, uh, economics and business administration has uh, stood out uh, significantly and uh, have become a benchmark uh, for all uh, the university. So and now it's time for, uh, as I said before, for acknowledgement and, uh, uh, and thanks. Among this uh, community of uh, professors, researchers, uh, students, uh, managers uh, who have uh, attained uh, this uh, position of uh, excellence, uh, I would like uh, to uh, point out uh, today especially the position of, of our uh, school of uh, uh, economics and, uh, and business administration, our, uh, our faculty. <coughs> Uh, perhaps uh, uh, it's, uh, the, his role is, is not the, the, the most uh, brilliant uh, compared to the role of uh, postgraduate schools or uh, research centers, but is uh, uh, a role we cannot dispense uh, with uh, in terms of uh, as a door of entrance uh, to the economics as a student, uh, uh, ones who uh, um, <coughs> create a future uh, vocations for uh, research of future uh, professionals. Uh, the, the, uh, along all these years, the faculty has uh, managed uh, to attract the best students. Uh, this is just very easy to see uh, the, the, the ratios of offer and demand in uh, the, the, the places uh, uh, in all the um, uh, grades offered uh, by the faculty of uh, economics. <coughs> it has also uh, manage uh, to strike uh, good partnerships with other studies uh, in our university. I am very proud as a former dean of the, the law school uh, to see how successful this new degree uh, in law and uh, uh, double degree in law and economics or business uh, has, uh, has been. Actually this uh, year uh, more than 60% of the, the students entering uh, this uh, grade have done it uh, with uh, coming with honors uh, uh, from from high school and as a vice rector of international relations I am also extremely proud about uh, the contributions of the economics the school to the interna internationalization of uh, our university uh, offering a whole uh, degree uh, in international business economics uh, in English uh, striking agreements with the best universities of, uh, of the war. I was told this morning, this year we are going <coughs> uh, uh, to send uh, 234 students uh, from all the uh, um, uh, grades offered by the faculty abroad. So uh, uh, more than 2,030 uh, uh, outgoing students. This is, uh, uh, I know, very difficult uh, to manage. Uh, the faculty is doing uh, greatly in managing this uh, complexity. I want to thank you them, I offer them my, my support. <coughs> well, uh, is an aquest uh, esprit, eh, com us deia, de, de reconeixement uh, uh, a la tasca de la, de la facultat i de tota la comunitat uh, d'estudiants, de, de, de uh, professors i gestors de la, <coughs> de la facultat i del Departament d'Economia i Empresa, que en nom del rector em complau uh, acabar aquest acte declarant formalment inaugurat el curs acadèmic 2012-2013 a la Facultat de Ciències Econòmiques i Empresarials. Moltes gràcies.